at the Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY Midtown Manhattan. It's 12 noon and it's slightly getting colder uh, in New York City and uh, um, people on the farmer's market which seem to be one of the very few places where one can go and see groups of people there already wearing scarves and longer jackets and um, and uh, everybody looks in others' eyes and uh, you can feel that sense of uncertainty of not knowing what will happen, and what is going on, what will be, and this catastrophic handling of the corona situation of the US government these days in Washington seems like the end of a, a Roman empire or something with uh, uh, empty halls and uh, the staff infected and people not telling the truth and uh, now Trump calling for um, imprisoning Joe Biden, uh, like the worst uh, of uh, dictatorship moves one, one can think of. And um, in these days, um, I think it is important also to really question what we are, where we come from, where we are going, what art and theater is all about. And uh, with us today, we have a worker in the vineyard of theater, as Tom Walker said on uh, on Wednesday uh, about his work with the Living Theater. We have the great uh, Saviana Stanescu with us, a Romanian playwright and poet. And um, she is uh, based uh, in New York, is in the New York State, teaching in Ithaca. And she has done many, many plays. I think the bio is listed on the uh, Howard and on the Siegel side, but Lenin Shu, Waxing West, uh, the Eocastus she did with Schachner, uh, um, Zoom birthday party, which she now did, and many, many, many other things um, are on her credit. Um, she has an MFA in traumatic writing uh, from NYU and performance studies. And she also founded the Immigrant International Artists and Scholars in New York, uh, an uh, organization, IAS, IASNY. And um, so, Saviana, um, welcome. You have been to the Siegel Center many times. Um, so, where are you at the moment? <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Frank, for inviting me. Um, I am in Ithaca, New York uh, this time. Um, so yeah, I, I teach um, at Ithaca College. Uh, we teach online, but um, I, la I left New York City in, uh, in March, late March, actually, after the theaters got closed. Um, at that time, I was working uh, on a project with um, Yasni, indeed, um, at the New Rican Poets Cafe. <clears throat> we have this um, regular project, Liberty's Daughters, Immigrant Women's Monologues. And at that time, we were working to present them live at the New Rican Poets Cafe in East Village. Uh, but then they, we presented them um, online. And we've done actually three more of those events. And uh, another one is coming up on October 25th with some great uh, uh, playwrights and writers presenting uh, Immigrant Women's uh, Monologues. So is it the New Rican Poetry Cafe with Daniel? And um, so you, you write those monologues, you co-write or? Uh... Oh, and for this particular event, I, I curate and um, host the, the evening. I organize it. So we have great playwrights. I present one of my monologues as well, but I also, of course, want to give other voices a chance to, to show their work um, as a community of, um, of, of writers. Um, who write immigrant stories. So for uh, the October 25th one coming up, we have great playwrights like Corey Thomas, Najla Said, uh, uh, Jessica Litvak, Al Alice uh, Eve Cohen, uh, Mariana Carreño, so, and others, they will present a short monologue. Uh, and this is what we are doing. That's part of my you know, community building and um, uh, you know, highlighting other immigrant voices or immigrant women's monologues. Yeah, next to your also successful career as playwriting, you always have been someone who also organizes, curates, produces, and you have seen this as part of your work. You contacted us also, we were, or we were in contact, our Prelude Festival that's coming up October 27 has the theme of revolutionary sites and sites and the idea of site and on some, but also the websites and the sites. And uh, you said, you know, you, you were working um, on a project, you know, at the time in, in, in Bucharest, that uh, is connected to that and this idea of, 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 of crisis, of uh, um, revolution, of something that, well, a turning point to revolve. 
Um, so tell us a bit about. Yeah, you know, as, as you know, the revolution is a, a, a topic and um, an, an important concept and idea and everything around um, revolution uh, I care about because as a young um, college student in Romania, I was uh, in the streets um, at the revolution against the totalitarian regime of dictator Ceausescu. All I knew in my life was uh, dictator Ceausescu's regime. I was born uh, during his uh, president presidency. So for us, it was this huge change to be in the streets. Many people died. And then- um, How old were you and what happened on the streets? Uh, well, I was a college student and um, uh, on December 21st, basically when in Bucharest things started, uh, they started a little earlier on December 16 in Timisoara, a town uh, in uh, northwestern Romania and many people died there and uh, Ceausescu died tried to keep... They died because... They, they, they were killed by the political police and the, the, the dictator's uh, uh, people. Shot, they were shot on the street. Shot. Yeah, and buried actually in secret, many people. So uh, they were trying to keep this, you know, a secret. And then um, Ceausescu organized a sort of meeting for the working class and the youth on December 21st in Bucharest in the hope that he would convince the people that no, everything is fine in <laughs> Romania. And that's when actually everything started, the, the unrest. So people started to boo him and um, the whole uh, uh, revolution started with um, uh, the masses booing him. And uh, of course, people got um, killed, got shot by uh, that time, the army and other political police um, uh, agents. And um, what happened, I'm, you know, I'm going to make a very long story short. Uh, uh, on December 22nd, actually, the army turned against the, the dictator. And that was, of course, a turning point for us as well. That's when the revolution was somehow officially winning um, on the national TV. Uh, people went and um, claimed the, the victory of the revolution. People still got killed. And we didn't know for sure who's shooting, who, who are these people still shooting us. And um, this was one of the slogans on the streets at that time. Who is shooting us? So it took a while, and then um, Ceausescu and his wife actually were put on a, on a short trial, controversial trial, um, and they were executed on Christmas Day. And the execution was broadcast for all of us on the evening of Christmas evening in 1989. Yeah. Kind of a, a bloody, a bloody revolution like the French Revolution, where blood actually was flowing. Yeah, yeah. Event. So that's why, for me, you know, these times of unrest. Actually, these days and this past month brought me back this feeling about the revolution. Of course, with Black Lives Matter and people who really need to change the system because uh, the, the system here has been oppressing black people and people of color for, for so long. So uh, there is a change in the air here as well, I feel. Um, and uh, people are indeed uh, trying to change the system in theater as well in many ways. Um, and um, I feel that um, that vibe, honestly, in the air. Of course, I, I don't want to have any violence or nobody wants that, but there is a, a feeling of change, of a big change that is happening and has to happen. And I know that um, in, in theater, it happens on many levels with the pandemic, people, uh, theaters are revisiting the, the, the ways in which they make theater uh, and they are revisiting uh, uh, the inclusion, the diversity and inclusion um, strategies they have in order to fully include um, uh, artists of color. Mm -hmm. How was your experience, you in a way, um, you know, you also an immigrant or you're living in exile, you are from Romania, you also part Roma, if I understand right, you came to the US, um, which, you know, has been accused as the, the dear white theater, you know, um, as institutional racism. How, how was your experience in the US? Oh my God! Yeah, no, this is such a long story, and I'm 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 really trying to make it short. Don't so, have to. We have time, you know. Okay, so. then. <laughs> then yeah. I'm gonna start from the revolution. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
basically, um, after the revolution, uh, you know, I always wanted to actually be a writer, an artist. You already write during the revolution? Was uh, did you yes. Uh, uh, what happened? Was theater done? Were performances part of it? Were uh, was a uh, I was a poet. Uh, I was a poet at the revolution, but at that time I couldn't publish because there was censorship, and my poems were were too dark. So there were there was censorship, and they would censor different uh, topics that couldn't be uh, published. So uh, the revolution actually meant um, freedom of expression for me maybe in the first place. So I could finally start writing for the free press. So I couldn't be a journalist at that time. Journalism meant lots of propaganda before yeah. the revolution, obviously. So there was no point to for me uh, to really be a writer because I'm the type of writer who likes to speak truth to power. So I'm always, you know, the type of uh, writer who goes for the difficult topics, uh, challenging the status quo, and that couldn't be done uh, during the dictatorship. But I started to work in the free press. I worked for a major daily newspaper like Adevaru, The Truth which was one of the most circulated newspapers. Uh, I um, started to also work for TV to be a contributor for Radio Free Europe. And uh, the 90s for me were part of this great energy of change. And I was in it, I was inside it because as a journalist, I was covering all the hot topics. I even got to interview the first woman prime minister of Turkey, Tansu Çiller. I was on the plane after the embargo with Serbia, to the plane to Belgrade to report on that. So, you know, it was a very exciting time and this journalistic spirit never left me. Even in my place, I always try to uh, to challenge um, the, the, and interrogate the topics that that are hot that uh, um, address um, our immediate uh, history. So after you know, while actually working as a journalist, I published um, three books of poetry, and my third book of poetry called "The Outcast" was actually a dramatic poem, a long dramatic poem about a woman running from everything. And um, uh, that dramatic poem got actually produced in theaters. It got produced in a theater in Galat, in the Southern Romania, and um, uh, different uh, actors would perform uh, my monologues, actually my poems, but they were considered monologues. So, you know, I made this transition to theater almost because uh, people started to perform my work. Uh, in 1998, I was invited to Paris to do Théâtre Gérard Philippe de Saint-Denis for a festival called Du Monde Antier, and they selected uh, one uh, playwright, actually, from each country that was part of the, the World Cup, uh, the Soccer World Cup. And from Romania, they selected me. I was considering my Myself a poet, but they called me a playwright. They produced this uh, outcast a dramatic poem, and um, I started to believe I was a playwright. Actually, it was also funny that our um, soccer team <laughs> lost to Cameroon. I remember, and yep. the newspapers would uh, would say um, our boys lost, but Saviana Stanescu is still in competition. <laughs> so it was uh, interesting and cool for me to become a playwright that way. But I, I needed to to start study playwriting because, you know, I'm this type of lifelong learner and student and we didn't have uh, dramatic writing or playwriting departments in Romania at that time, late Which 90s. Lots of European countries didn't exist, even in Germany you would not yeah, that's why I was actually very happy when I was offered a, a small fellowship to go to study playwriting in Germany at the International Summer Academy in Ruhr, in Bochum. And um, uh, I studied with, uh, uh, I studied in English with uh, David Harrower, a Scottish playwright, Olivier, Olivier Award winner. And uh, Phyllis Nash, who's an American playwright and screenwriter, she wrote the screenplay for Carol. I think she's based in LA now. So that's how I actually wrote my very first play, short play in English, Final Countdown. 
And then that play, um, uh, I worked on the Romanian version. It got translated into French as well. It got published in Paris. Um, so I was a little bit up on the wave in the late 90s in Romania and um, uh, Europe a little bit. And um, uh, yeah, the, the roads were opening up for me. I won the best play of the year, Uniter Award in 2000. Uniter being the Theater Guild of Romania. And they, they have this one, uh, they have many awards for actors, directors, of course, producers, uh, set designers, but they also have one award to the best play of the year. And I won it in uh, 2000 for the Inflatable Apocalypse. So uh, things were opening up. I got invited to, I got accepted into the Royal Court Theatre International Program. But at the same time, I got the Fulbright grant uh, to, to go to New York University uh, as a Fulbright Fellow. So it was a, a, a difficult decision. There was this Elise Dobson this, uh, in London, Royal Court? The yeah, I didn't go to Royal Court. I went to New York. So basically what happened at that time, I was actually on a, on a fellowship in Vienna, a culture contact fellowship. So things were happening. Uh, I was a writer in residence to work on a play about Egon Schiele. So Culture Contact, which is a great organization offering fellows, uh, fellowships to artists to really work on projects, uh, got me to Vienna for three months. And uh, when I, I um, uh, got the Fulbright Fellowship, that was a, a huge turning point for me. I didn't come just as a visiting artist. I decided to get enrolled again as a student, a graduate student in performance studies at New York University T School of the Arts. And that was because in Germany, actually, I met Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet, who's a professor at NYU Tisch. And she, I worked with her. We did a site specific project in the Zollverein mine, I remember, in Ruhr. And it was very fascinating. So I realized that my world was somehow small. I needed to, to, to go and understand more uh, about other cultures, about um, other people, and uh, BKG. Um, helped me to get the, uh, to get, um, uh, you know, accepted with the Fulbright Fellowship um, at NYU. And actually that's where I met uh, Richard Schechner, who was already a legend in Romania as well. So it was huge for me to get to be his writer in residence and to work together on Yocastas and Yocastas Redux. It was actually the first time when I was writing in English such a, you know, <laughs> important work, um, you know, a full length play. So that was in a way the best school for me uh, to write in English. I wrote for Richard so many scenes and not all of them made it of course in the final script, but that was the beauty of it. That with Richard Schechner, you as a playwright need to be in rehearsals with the actors, with um, the director, with the creative team. And um, I would um, write scenes and we would try them with the actors. And it's such an interesting and collaborative process. And I, I loved I loved to work with Richard and that was um, a big point for me. And then I was offered a, a fellowship to do an MFA in dramatic writing at um, NYU. So I stayed a little longer, uh, especially because actually when I got to New York, it was first, it was for two weeks before 9-11. So um, we experienced the 9-11 moment during the first um, days of school at NYU with the performance studies uh, um, colleagues. And uh, for us, the, the you know, 2001 and 2002 became this um, major year of transformation. All our work was somehow connected to 9-11. We all bonded so much because we were part of New York at that time, uh, you know, when the city was, uh, was wounded. So we all felt um, New Yorkers, like we are New Yorkers. And ever since um, I fell in love with New York and um, I still love it. Um, I feel I'm still a part of it, even if sometimes I'm in Ithaca, sometimes in Bucharest, or in other countries of the world. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, I think it was Hans here who, who, who talked about um, that we need to reflect, you know, on um, the awareness of the complexity of a historical situation. 
and that poetry and theater is part of the reflection of it. Okay. And, um, and so you were there for that quite, you know, uh, quite, a, quite traumatic revolution in Romania, which has been still talked about as a, something that's very different than what happened in East Germany. They went on the streets, but there was never, you know, a fight for it. Actually, Solidarność, I think the Polish uh, uh, um, movement accused the East Germans say that was not a revolution. You call for it, but I think they really did went out. They put their lives at risk. But it was very different um, um, than than what you saw. You saw 9/11, and now you feel um, you feel something in the atmosphere. that reminds you of of, of the uh, complexity of these historical moments where life changed, where the world changed. What traces do you think? Uh, um, um, will be left. What what should people be uh, working on at this moment now? What what do you think? Um, well, um, f first of all, you know that um, I was in Romania during my sabbatical semester in the fall 2019, precisely to be there at 30 years after the revolution and to write and develop a play about the Romanian revolution in Romanian. So it was very powerful for me to, to go back and uh, bring my knowledge of you know, dramatic writing and craft back to Romania and uh, the new play development process, which is not uh, so well known over there, to bring it back and develop um, this play called um, Kilometer Zero, Kilometer Zero, uh, the revolution project uh, to, to my Romanians. We developed it from scratch, first with uh, four actors when I was in residence at the National Museum of Literature in Bucharest. Uh, and then um, I directed two stage readings at the Cultural Center of Bucharest in October and um, uh, December 2019. The first one was part of the International Theatre Platform, the Bucharest International Theatre Platform. Uh, they commissioned us first to, to present uh, and to actually to develop this play about the revolution. And um, uh, then I, uh, I came back to the US, to New York actually in uh, January, um, 2020, um, and I was working in uh, New York, um, as I said, when the pandemic happened, um, and then I got here in Ithaca to, 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 to teach, but a young director in Romania, Andrei Majer, a very talented director, very, very visual, a wizard of uh, stage images, he um, attended the stage reading, he loved the play, and he proposed it to Odeon Theater in Bucharest. Odeon is a very prestigious theater in Bucharest, Broadway-like house, very beautiful. And um, Andre worked with four uh, actors from the Odeon uh, during the summer. They rehearsed with masks on, and it was very difficult and very brave of them to rehearse at that time. But finally, um, with a very uh, big and interesting set that was created by Konstantin uh, Chibotariu, a wonderful set designer. Um, and um, these four actors from Odeon, Ioana Bugarin, Diana Georgian, Nicoleta Lefter, and Alexandru Papadopol, who are both film and theater actors, worked so hard and they all managed to open actually the play in a <laughs> very visual multimedia production. Uh, on September 27, 2020, just a few weeks ago. They had a few shows. I hear it went very well. I got many messages. I didn't see the production. And uh, unfortunately, yesterday, uh, theaters got closed again in uh, Romania oh. because uh, COVID uh, cases spiked again. So they had a run of 10 days, incredible. Um, so uh, Saviana, if I, I think I'm not miscounting. It's 30 years since that December uprising. Um, does it take 30 years? Will it be 30 years uh, for artists to work on that time you live in now? What, um, well, you know, for me, it took so long to be able to write about the revolution. Um, I remember in 1990, immediately after, uh, Carol Churchill, a British uh, playwright that I, I admire, 
came to Bucharest with Mark Wink Davy, and today um, did a workshop and research on the revolution. Then um, they went back to Royal Court Theatre in London, and Carrie Churchill uh, wrote this wonderful play, Mad Forest. Um, they uh, opened at Royal Court Theatre, and ever since, Mad Forest is one of the most uh, produced plays and maybe the most well known play about the Romanian Revolution. So I feel that um, maybe. Uh, British playwrights and um, US playwrights, many of them uh, might be better than us, the Romanians, at responding to their own history or to the, the events that are hot. Uh, and this is what I learned actually by studying in New York and NYU and working in New York for so long, that um, it's important to, to be there and to write a play to respond to your own history and to uh, your own identity. So uh, for me, it became, you know, um, a sort of self-imposed mission as well uh, that I needed to go back and find, get some sort of closure on those events for me and maybe my friends and some of the Romanian people and to interrogate those events. So we can bring a perspective from inside as well. Uh, I mean, I really appreciate Mad Forest. I think it's a great play and it was needed. It's important to have perspectives from outside, but it's also necessary to have uh, some uh, views and perspectives from inside the culture. Uh, so uh, that was my one of my main motivations besides the, the personal need for closure and for interrogating those events, for really uh, trying to figure out what they meant for me, what they meant for our friends. And I must tell you that the talkbacks that we had after the presentations were so powerful. Young people in Romania, they were saying, oh, wow, I didn't even know about these things. It's so great that you are doing this because we get to, to finally talk about the revolution. We don't learn about it in the history textbooks. We, why don't we? So I felt, you know, that I brought a small revolution as well in just talking about certain issues that people don't talk enough in Romania. For instance, I have a gay character uh, that um, he, the character would be based in Berlin and he's married over there, um, a happy marriage. They adopted a uh, daughter, but but, uh, you know, in Romania, LGBTQ issues are still problematic. Uh, homosexuality was crime criminalized until 2002. So there is a lot of stigma that's still associated uh, to LGBTQ issues. So I felt that it was important to bring this character on stage. I actually um, invited a New York actor, Romanian uh, actor, Philip Condescu, to, to read that character and to talk about his experience a gay man men in Romania during the totalitarian system and after. Um, then I brought many feminist teams on stage. So I feel that I'm doing something uh, necessary over there, although it's hard for me. It's hard for me to go back and to write in Romanian. And I think I'm trying to do the same here in the US and it's hard here as well. It's hard to, to be an immigrant writer, Tell an international about. writer and to- how, how do you see like, like Carol Churchill saw the revolution or whatever. So how do you look at the New York or American theater system? How did you experience it? Yes, I feel, uh, yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot to say, but um, I definitely feel it's very hard for us international uh, artists, international writers in particular, because I feel that the uh, directors or set designers, because they have mainly a visual vocabulary, uh, they are, you know, their work can be easier understood and accepted and uh, uh, admired. But for, for writers, and especially writers like me who write in English, they're, they're, I don't, um, I haven't worked with a translator since uh, 2001. Um, it's very important uh, for us to also feel that we belong here as um, immigrant writers and our work uh, uh, matters as much as uh, uh, the work of uh, US born uh, uh, writers. So for me, especially it was very hard because I got here in my early thirties. It's one thing to start writing English after you went to school or high school here in the US. And another thing to come like me and write your first place in English 
in my early 30s. But I still think that, you know, I, I'm, I've been doing a good job. I have many plays that have been produced um, off Broadway and uh, downtown and in regional theaters. But, um, you know, I must not lie, you know, it's a huge struggle that I constantly, uh, I try to get better and better. And now after 19 years in the US, I feel that um, my uh, writing has finally gotten more sophisticated. And this is uh, the moment when I feel, yeah, now, now I need uh, more work and uh, more recognition. Now I finally um, am a 19 year old uh, American writer <laughs> writing in English. So yes, so I'm trying hard to balance uh, my own work with uh, the work that I do for the community, for the international community, for the work with, with the work that I do for my students, because uh, I teach playwriting, I produce uh, the new play incubator, uh, a festival of uh, new plays by by students and alumni at Ithaca College. So I feel that um, I've been doing a lot for international exchange, for promoting international playwrights. Uh, but you know. <laughs> How and when do I find um, enough time and resources to focus on my own work? Because uh, you know you, know, you need to make a living. You need to uh, have some money to pay the rent. So it's been a constant struggle for me as well. I, I just wish I would get some of those uh, big fellowships that would allow me to just focus on writing and my own artistic work for a couple of years. But. Uh, you know, probably not. So I do the best thing, the best next thing. I try to, to teach and I try to do my artistic work. And in terms of theater during the pandemic, uh, well, actually we did um, lots of um, online theater. Uh, I worked with the Cherry Art Space in, in Itaca. They actually opened their space a few years ago with um, a new play that I wrote for them, What Happens Next? Uh, what happens next is a sort of science fiction play and they opened uh, a new space that they built from scratch in Itaca. Uh, Cherry is a very experimental and interesting uh, place that not many people know about because it's not um, in New York. And um, they also commissioned six international playwrights. We had um, a very cool, I think, online show uh, back in May, you know, the beginning of uh, online theater. And my play Zoom birthday party was produced as part of that project. Uh, it was very exciting to write a play for Zoom. And actually that play now will be presented in the National Theater Festival in Romania. They asked me to provide a, a Romanian translation so they can put subtitles. So it will be presented um, uh, at the beginning of November uh, at the National Theater Festival in Romania. I just got some emails to, to make this happen. So I'm happy that in a way the pandemic put me back on track um, with the work I do in other countries and particularly in Romania. I wish there was more of that happening with New York as well. Um, I wish that the New York City theaters would work more with global writers and immigrant writers. At this point, I only got a commission from a, a theater company called Transforma for a science play festival. So I wrote for them a play called uh, Zebra 2.0, a play <laughs> about the friendship or maybe love between uh, an, inter an artificial intelligence and an undocumented um, janitor. So I'm very excited about that play, but uh, I don't know when they will, will be able to, to produce it. Uh, so I do have another short play, Don't Dream, a monologue of an undocumented worker that can be presented by actresses of any ethnicity and race. And I was very happy to have this short play um, presented by the National Black Theater, by the American Slavery Project, by the uh, Royal National Theater in London, as part of events um, regarding women's rights to vote in London. And actually, right now, it's still online with two other plays by Judy Tate, uh, four-time Emmy winner, Judy Tate. Uh, and um, she's the leader of um, American Slavery Project. And they have this project, Black Women and the Ballot. 
and I'm very honored to be included in this project with my short play, Don't Dream, performed by a wonderful Black actress, Lynette uh, Freeman. And uh, that's still online. Uh, yeah, go to the American Slavery Project, Black Women and the Ballot. It's still online. For, for, you can watch it for free until the elections. So yeah. these are only a few things that I've been working on. Uh, I wish, um, yeah, I wish I could do more. So, um, uh, Saviana, um, for, for months at the Siegel, the first four months, every day of the week, from Monday to Friday, we talk to artists. It was about Corona and the situation. We also do feel now we open it up a bit to curators, thinkers, but also to the political, the idea of theater, and the politic political, not politics, but the political. You worked as a journalist. Also, you said these themes are of significance to you. Do you see yourself as a political artist, our activist? And if so, how do you define that? Yeah, thank you for this question. Yes, I do see myself as a political uh, writer and an artivist, artivist, uh, not activist. As you know, unfortunately, the term activist has still a, a negative connotation in Romania because of the totalitarian system. So uh, each time I say that in Romania, they go like, oh, what? So I'm trying to, to be clear that um, what I try to do is, yes, to, to use the power of theater and the power of uh, playwriting uh, to um, tackle and interrogate themes that are uh, relevant for our times, themes that need to be interrogated and challenged and uh, uh, the truth that needs to be spoken to the power of the moment. I mean, ever since my first dramatic poem, The Outcast, I have written plays about outcasts, about people that are marginalized, that are misunderstood, that are outsiders, people who uh, would like to belong and they can't fully do that because the society doesn't allow them to do so. So I do feel that I am a political writer in the sense that um, I really try to bring uh, the voices of outsiders to the main stages. And um, I, I really try to, to bring these perspectives uh, that you know, to, that challenge uh, the, the power dynamics of the moment. So I am interested in uh, power dynamics and in, in exploring uh, the power relationships between individuals and between countries. So I feel that um, ever since I uh, arrived to New York, I started to understand better the, the bigger picture, the bigger global picture. So I consider myself uh, a global Artivist as well. Uh, I am trying to address these issues of power between humans and between uh, and among uh, countries, and um, yeah, just interrogate these issues and uh, to speak truth to power in a way that has a little bit of humor because we know what George Bernard Shaw or Oscar Wilde said: if you are to tell people the truth. You better make them laugh, otherwise they kill you. <laughs> so I always try to, to bring a little bit of humor, maybe because, uh, you know, the old Romanian saying, uh, one eye cries, one eye laughs. So I come from this tradition, then, um, you know, of um, things that can be done at the same time. You know, you can address important issues and be political but also laugh um, at certain things. So that ambiguity I'm trying to bring a little bit on to American stages because I do think we need to address these major issues and political issues. Uh, but I also think that we need to be able to be comfortable with the multiplicity of voices and meanings, uh, be comfortable with non-binary thinking you know, non-binaries, multiplicity of, of roots and belonging. I love this concept of a professor at Columbia University, Vishaka Desai. Uh, yes, this multiplicity, multiplicity of identities needs to be celebrated, not othered. So I think that that's my somehow core message that I'm trying to bring through my place. 
while also creating, you know, engaging characters and uh, powerful stories, I also think I bring a poetic realism, uh, stylized realism, not necessarily the mainstream realism, psychological realism that the American stages might be used to. So yes, you know, it's hard on many levels to, to bring these different voices and the storytelling uh, approaches to American stages. That's why we do need this revolution. We do need uh, to, to challenge, you know, the, the mainstream aesthetics as well in all these terms. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, which is interesting. I mean, the Remini Protocol, for example, says we are architects, but we're also journalists. And they say we also make theater. And I don't think they're just joking uh, in, in say, you know, or, you know, in, in, a, in a funny way, but they, they see them their work as, a, as research. Um, we're gonna have a series coming up also with Carol Martin on, you know, the theater of the real that became also in the uh, pandemic, I think a new, uh, a new meaning in a way um, where research and, um, and putting, you know, um, the real, whatever it is, but what theater always has investigated, what is real? What's reality? What's not? What's fiction? What's in our mind? So, so these things, what we see, the apple and the image of the apple in our mind, and the image of the image of the image. Um, how do you approach your work then? Do you uh, do interviews the way you produce it? Is that formally, do you sit like a, a, a player, you sit at home, you type, you write, you listen to talks, or you go out, you interview, read articles, or you invite people for the How do you produce? your work for these new forms? What, what can we learn from the way you do it? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I, you know, I have different approaches because first of all, uh, studying both performance studies and dramatic writing at NYU, I got um, different approaches to uh, being a writer uh, from performance studies and um, uh, generally from experimental theater and environmental theater and downtown theater, I learned to work more collaboratively. Yes, to do documentary theater or site specific projects or uh, develop projects with a company of actors. But then uh, when I started dramatic writing, I learned to be more rigorous as a playwright and um, working with the Lark Play Development Center to develop all my new plays, actually. Uh, I learned about the playwright as the center of the room and um, uh, with a team that works around the playwright's voice to, to make that play better and better. So I think I've been using these different approaches in my work. Uh, I, I realized that, you know, the, the playwright's voice approach can bring you closer to, to mainstream theater. I mean, off-Broadway plays, uh, Broadway plays are generally uh, focused on uh, the playwright's voice. It's not so much about ensembles or uh, collaborative or work. Yeah. Yeah, as the downtown theater might arguably be. And I'm simplifying this thing. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. people, you know, the, there is a, a nuanced discussion to, to be had. And of course, books like Carol Martins and Richard Schechner's and many other books speak better than me about ensemble theater and the theater of the real and the downtown theater. But um, at this point, I feel closer uh, to the idea of being a playwright. To, to have having the concept, writing, doing my own research, writing a first draft or just a few scenes and then hearing them aloud with actors. And based on the questions and the input that I have from the actors, I go further, I work with the director and um, other actors or the same actors, if you know, they are committed to, to the work. To, to write a new draft of the play, to do a stage reading, to maybe do a workshop. So this is pretty much the, the, um, the way in which Lark Play Development Center or New York Theater Workshop or Ensemble Studio Theater EST work to bring new plays to life through a new play development process that is centered on the voice um, of the playwright. And I like that because, uh, yeah, I feel that in Romania, I didn't have much of a chance to you know, just um, be a playwright that drives the process. 
while here uh, in New York, especially, I did get the chance through the lark to, to, to have my voice heard as a playwright and develop new work. For instance, I like this process of being commissioned by a company to, to write a new play. Most recently, the Civic Ensemble, a very interesting company focused on social, you know, theater for social change and uh, political theater, uh, commissioned me to write a play for them. And um, uh, the producer, Godfrey Simmons, who's a wonderful actor and producer and director, uh, asked me to, to write whatever I wanted. He really liked that monologue uh, about um, the undocumented worker. So I started with that monologue and wrote a play called uh, Be Trapped Inside a Window, which actually discusses three women of different ethnicities. One is white, she has a black daughter. So it's very interesting to explore that dynamic. And the other one is uh, the, um, the housekeeper, the domestic worker of their neighbors. So it, it interrogates these relationships, you know, not just between ethnicities, but between people engaged in, you know, different activities and how they relate to each other. Uh, how can people be really seen? Do we really see our neighbors? Do we really see the person next door? Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, uh, concerned with this kind of issues and I'm trying to explore them in my place and be trapped aside the window, uh, had a few stage readings and we are hoping for a production soon. It's, uh, it's been directed by the wonderful Vernice Miller who's a, a great actress and director as well. So this is the most recent project that I'm working on and um, I enjoy the process very much. So again, I wrote the first draft I heard it with actors. I wrote a few new drafts. I gave them to the producer. They organized a workshop for, uh, of a week to, to uh, develop the text further. We had a drama tour, Walter Sean. So I like this work of uh, uh, collaborating with a team, but I also like at this point to, to you know, write my own plays, to write my first draft and uh, dr drive a little bit the process of new play development. Mm -hmm. So, so um, in a way you agree, uh, Bonnie Maranka talks about that. She feels perhaps we live in a time of writing, of golden writing, where it again becomes at the center. There's the misunderstanding of post-traumatic theater that writing wasn't, you know, a center anymore. I think Hans Limon always would say that writing is significant as light and as movement, also light and movement and stage direction is as significant as writing. So we have to pay attention. That is actually what made new work, contemporary work, post-traumatic work so interesting and exciting, but writing of Jelinek or Polish or, Others or a handke who we favor so much. Um, it, um, it always, you know, has been a part of it, and, um, and there was a feeling that also in a lot of downtown theater, but perhaps also in the off Broadway scene, um, it was so psychologically realistic and uh, repetitive, not full of surprises, and um, and that perhaps now there is a resurgence that playwriting. Um, is again, uh, or writing itself, perhaps novels, also poetry, you know, is perhaps a stronger a form um, and to capture and uh, the, the, the historical significance of the moment that we are in to, to capture traces of it. Do you feel um, that this is the case? Romania also is a director driven theater, like most of Berlin's or European theater is, not in London, but, uh, but do you feel writing and words? are at the center, should be at the center of trying to create meaning of that time we're in, in theater and performance? Well, you know, things have changed for me many times in terms of how I understand the theater and the performance generally. Uh, strangely enough, I think I was more post-dramatic when I started in Romania with my poetic text, non-narrative, uh, non-realistic characters, absurdist, um, poetic, long monologues. But uh, studying at NYU in dramatic writing, I became more, um, I would say, um, um, 
dramatic, <laughs> not post-dramatic. I went a little bit back into the, the dramatic work with um, a story, fleshed out characters, dramatic arc, dramatic intention, all those things. Uh, I cannot fully say that I'm still, and I could ever be a fully, you know, a traditional writer in that sense. So my plays will always have elements that are, are non-narrative, that are post-dramatic, that are postmodern, that are uh, non-linear, that are poetic or stylized. Um, I, uh, I always worked with, um, you know, other media as well, with uh, dancers and choreographers. I wrote a text for uh, Dan Safer's Witness Relocation. Um, so I feel that I've always collaborated with um, visual artists very well. I, I like all these things. So for me as an artist, as an interdisciplinary artist, to a certain extent, all these um, forms of creating art make sense and uh, I embrace them. Uh, however, the, the closest to my heart is uh, indeed uh, writing and um, having the words at the center of what I have to express. I'm, uh, and I do that in, in my place. I also write fiction. I'm working on a novel. I still write poetry. I'm writing a memoir. So while I always like to also do some works that engage uh, with the audiences in a more interdisciplinary way, uh, visual or multimedia, I do go back uh, to, to writing. And um, I hope to find, I always hope to find collaborators in which, uh, with which I, with whom I, I can really uh, collaborate well and they can bring their own expertise as visual artists or directors or choreographers. Uh, but at the end of the day, I feel that, um, oh, I shouldn't say that, but I will say it. I feel that I just want to be a writer at the end of the day, uh, a writer that does engage with, with visual elements and multimedia and interdisciplinarity. Uh, but um, I do want to be a writer. And for instance, um, you know, oh, uh, speaking about theater during the pandemic, I just wrote a, a short monologue uh, of a fortune teller, uh, Flora Wisdom, uh, for a company called Nomad Theatrical of uh, uh, run by Grant Neal and uh, Leanne Hutchinson. Grant Neal is an actor who I wrote uh, Polanski Polanski for, a uh, one-man show that we toured over to the Romania and in other countries at the Hungarian State Theater in uh, Cluj. And um, oh, he was also in Porgy and Bess, an actor um, uh, as, a, as the detective at the Metropolitan Opera. So I am saying this is that I feel that now people intersect more than ever in terms of downtown artists, interdisciplinary artists, experimental artists, and uh, mainstream artists. So I feel that now there is an opportunity with this revolution uh, to stop thinking in, in these terms and um, in, in terms of mainstream, Broadway, uh, off-Broadway, downtown, and um, you know, try to embrace these um, multiple possibilities of what we can bring on stages. So do I want to work on Broadway? You bet I do, you know. I hope actually Broadway producers would, uh, would come to me and would be interested to, to develop one of my plays or yes, a musical. Uh, so at this point of my life, um, I feel the need um, to have the freedom of expression uh, in a full way, you know. I work hard for it. I struggled for so long. I do want to be able to bring my voice with all the nuances and the knowledge that um, I embraced and um, I gathered during the, during the years. So yeah, yeah, so I guess um, at this point, um, I like to be working as a writer. I like to be commissioned to write plays for Broadway, off Broadway. I like to write for TV. Many of my playwrights friends write for TV and uh, I, I love TV as well, so. I would totally embrace the chance to be part of a writer's room or develop a new show for, for TV. I mean, you know, we are here on Zoom, you know. It's time for us artists, I feel, at least I feel so, to work in different media and embrace the creativity that we can bring in different media. Mm -hmm. 
to also live the multiple identities who you feel, you know, you have to reflect on stage. So they have to reflect on life. It's true in a way what you said that, you know, the Broadway and off and downtown, you know, um, are, are um, equal options. And right now, I guess for the first time, they all share the same uh, uh, experience. They're all closed down, whether you're Broadway or off off. And it doesn't used to be. If you had the money, you could. Now you can't. And there's something, uh, something interesting in that. And to see who does work now, who produces, you know, we're going to have uh, Hamdan uh, out um, from LaGuardia College, who produces online festival, the festivals you talk about, but we do not see it from a billion dollar industry uh, of Broadway to engage, to do mass, to have food kitchen support artists. Even the Met, if I understand right, hasn't paid the artists, the opera for, for since March, and uh, they're not going to open up for a year because financially it doesn't make sense. Why aren't they singing in the parks, you know? And uh, I'm sure the people in the offices are all paid. So uh, what's going on here if it's about creating um, um, a work and art for, for the people of, of, of New York City? But I also wanted to ask you, and, um, and good to see, to get an update from you, what's on your mind, what you're thinking, what you're working on, but how are you as a person? How is Samyana experiencing this time? How, how do you feel? Well, yeah, thank you for this question. You know, what can I say? You know, I sacrificed as so much as a person to just be able to do my work, my creative work. Um, that's why in a way for me, these things are, you know, equivalent. My career, what I do for my art and uh, my well-being as a person. When I don't work on a project, on an artistic project, when I don't write something with the idea that it, with a sort of clear goal that will have, it will have a reading or a production, I don't feel myself. I get literally sick, you know? Uh, I really enjoy working with directors like Tamila Woodard. We developed so many great projects together and she was on your show as well, on your talks. With Tamila, we developed a project called Enslaved about sex and human traffic. I, I love to really be working and collaborating with artists. So it, it's very hard for me at this time because, you know, I live by myself. Uh, I'm trying to do my best to teach my classes well and support my students. Uh, but, you know, as a person, as an artist, what do I have for me? What I have for me at this point in my life is just um, working on the projects that I love and seeing them uh, on stage or at least on screen. So, yeah, it's hard for me to say, how am I doing as a person? Because uh, I invested so much in this life, uh, in my um, writing, in my artistic work, in my career, in starting all over again and uh, being resilient and uh, in this continuous struggle of, you know, having my voice heard as an artist, as a writer, that um, I cannot even, make the you know the distinction between me as a person and um, uh, Saviana as as an artist <laughs> so maybe you know uh, I can talk more about me as a person when we're gonna meet over I don't know a glass of wine in New York when the restaurants are open and the theaters are open and we can go see a show and then talk about that show in a nice restaurant so you know I like this kind of stuff that's why I love New York and that's why I loved and I still love that beautiful artistic spirit and community of New York because over there, yes, you feel that you are present. You are a part of the tapestry of that wonderful city of people of different colors and races and ethnicities and genders and uh, that multiplicity I was talking about I think um, it's best represented by New York for me and I know this is such a silly uh, you know love letter for New York but it is how I feel and I hope um, um, we can be back soon into you know that uh, wonderful spirit of uh, artists in New York however if that's not possible too soon 
I hope we can do more, you know, theater and uh, art and uh, film and <laughs> TV um, and do things on the screen and in any other form that we can do our art because there will always be a need for storytelling. There will always be a need for art. And we artists have always found different ways to, to tell our stories. I mean, look what I have here. I have a, it's a queer, <laughs> I mean, you know, writers had to write in different ways in different media. So we're just gonna survive and tell our stories in any new possible ways. Yeah, yeah. And the way we write, you know, I think Goethe who was right was the quill and the post carriage on his way to Italy. That's what he did, you know, was jumping or first writers using typewriters, you know, um, which was an offense in the very beginning to get a type written note from friend or from an embassy and then computers and then handwriting. And uh, so, yeah, so there, and it influences us very deeply. Kittler, the great uh, German uh, um, um, linguist said, you know, big revolutions actually changes in artistic uh, expression and capturing uh, the importance of historical moments through the arts actually happened uh, when these media, new mediums came up, you know, when Bob Dylan was playing all this an electric guitar and it was people were furious now everybody does it or when the first computers were used, the first typewriters, when the po poets uh, uh, heard a recording of their own voice through Edison, the first of the shock they experienced, or when the first stories, little story, all of a sudden were on a screen like uh, the Blue Angel by, by Heinrich Mann, a small novella, all of a sudden went around the world and something completely changed. And I think this is a time where we, where we do also live in something is change, changing, something has changed. And uh, we, we um, have to find a way to uh, understand it better. And artists are the ones who really are part of it, uh, uh, anticipating it and, uh, and also making us comfortable uh, with what is coming. I, I do hope that what is coming is better as it is now and things as you also said have to change there have to be better ways of it art is there for the people for everybody like new york speaking about new york city all five boroughs we need to find new ways we are trying to create a new festival also in 2022 engaging all five neighbors but also all new york presenting organizations and new york international festival of the arts where we hope that artists from the Siegel talks will all participate and um and be part of it and also something radically different like the berlin festspiele it was Thomas Oberander who had a project now that was called Unplugged, where there was no electricity use. Significant artists, no electricity used. No lights, no air conditioning, and they said, no flights, you know. And um, so they, how does, how would that look like? And it's like, and many, many other, other things. Um, we are coming close also to an end and really, really thank you for, for sharing this, uh, this, this moment in your life and your experience and to talk about uh, um, 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 your work. Um, what inspires you? What artists are you look up to in theater, but also what do you read? What are you listening to? What keeps your motor warm or running? Well, um, it's very inspiring for me to read the novels, actually. I'm a big fan of Toni Morrison. And um, uh, yesterday, the Cornell University organized a very impressive marathon of reading the whole uh, uh, novel, The Bluest Eye. I, I love that novel. So it was amazing to have these different um, uh, black artists and scholars uh, read the, the entire novel. I love that her writing, I love the language. Um, I love the, yeah, I love everything about that type of, of writing that's very rich and poetic. Um, in terms of theater, uh, I, I love many playwrights and uh, directors and uh, many people I had a chance to, to, to work with. And um, I love Lynn Nottage uh, as a playwright, for instance. But there are so many that um, I'm sure that if I start uh, saying a few names, mm -hmm. I'm going to, uh, uh, to miss others. Um, so uh, what can I say? I also love directors that are creative. I like I love Taylor Mac and uh, <laughs> uh, their uh, uh, flamboyant and unique and uh, multi-dimensional um, creativity. Uh, what can I say? There, I love Rajiv Joseph, who was my my uh, classmate at NYU. I love uh, his work as well. Um, there are many many people whose work I love and. I'm just uh, proud to be working with them uh, in other projects. Uh, I, uh, for me, I try to be with other 
inspiring artists. So, you know, any chance um, I get to, to work with others is a pleasure, a blessing mm -hmm. and an honor. And what are you listening to? What are you reading? Oof. Yeah, well, um, I'm not listening so much uh, music at this time because it's such a busy time with teaching and um, I have to, to prepare uh, for, for my classes. So I, have, I still have to, to read uh, lots of the, reread the, the plays that I teach, the, uh, the scholarly work uh, that I teach. So I'm very much immersed in, um, in uh, reading, um, uh, you know, the works that I need to, to teach in my classes. I also, you know, again, the spirit of our time, I race talk and the conspiracy of silence. I, I read a lot about anti-racism, about how can we talk about race. So, um, I'm trying to, you know, to be as present as I can and understand as well as I can the spirit of the moment here in the US. And it's not easy, you know, to leave this in between us uh, of cultures because, you know, there are certain values and certain um, things that have relevance in Romania and other things that have relevance here uh, in the US. Some things have relevance in New York, others in the regional theater. So I'm trying to constantly navigate this intersection of uh, perspectives and cultures and uh, find my, my little place and center somehow as an artist. Yeah, yeah, and uh, to, to have that, you know, you have that photo of New York City behind you, but through the curtain, we see the landscape of Ithaca and maybe some, a Romanian painting of flowers, maybe, I don't know, maybe I might uh, Im imagine it. So really you carry uh, all these worlds with you on your shoulders, in your handbags, in your toolbox, and, um, and, um, and you invite audience to share your experience and to celebrate it and to maybe even ask um, bigger and, um, and a better question. And I think it is important for all of us, you know, also to really listen uh, to, to Saviana, uh, Cristina Mondriano, uh, who wrote, I think, a history of, of, of the Romanian um, and theater, and she said um, why it was um, important, you know, to, to, to listen to. She said, you know, they're victims of totalitarian regimes, people in the post-communist countries turned overnight into heavy users of kind of a Western consumption society. And again, they felt they are victims. You know, so one train was replaced with another, but they also were on the passive side of the victim side of the abuse side. And you go through these two systems on both and your observations as a, as a traveler, as a wanderer, as a nomad between um, the two worlds. Um, it, is, uh, it is really um, of significance and, uh, and your research, what should we present as civil ceremonies? You know, something that I think Rancia talks about. What do, replace the pomp of the kings and the religious ceremonies and all that, we have to replace it with something new. And it is the art, but what is it that we really offer? What really is it that carries meaning, makes a difference, helps us to understand where we are? And I think your work is a real research towards that uh, contribution. Well, actually, um, Christina Modrano, who's an old friend of mine, she, she wrote for the same newspaper. Uh, who did? Yeah, actually, after I left that newspaper, so, you know, I had to leave uh, Romania, yeah. she was the one that um, uh, took my job, <laughs> basically. So I, we are old friends, and she's the one who commissioned the Revolution Project for the International Theater Platform. Oh, so we go is, way yeah. back, and um, we'd be working, yeah, very well together. I, I love Christina, and she, she's, for me, an old friend and a great um, uh, collaborator. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that is important. You know, she wrote about that uh, that uh, Romanian director uh, Pintili, who was about to set himself on fire. He said, "If you censor my play, I'm going to burn myself." You know, I mean, there's serious work that has been not only Shaban, uh, so many uh, Chi Chi and so many others. It's this great, great history that comes out. We don't know as much here in the, uh, the United States, but it's a significant contribution. UNESCO, of course, everybody has heard, and uh, but it is a, a significant force in the history of theater, and you are yeah. part of it. Yeah. And yeah, but as you know, I mean, maybe the the most arguably the, the most well known Romanian artists in the U.S. are uh, 
uh, men artists, male artists, yeah. you know, yeah. wonderful directors like Andrei Sherban, of course, Chule and Pintilia and Belgrader and the wonderful writers like poets and fiction writers like Andrei Kodrescu. But, uh, you know, I wish that we women writers have a little bit more of a voice here. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to bring a little bit of I mean, we had Giannina Carbonario here and uh, Michaela Dragan, you know, and uh, and others, and also you. So we are trying to make our contribution, you know, to to have, make to extend yeah. our view of it. And this is also one of the ideas, you know, of the Cedo talk. So um, yeah, I love uh, Michaela Dragan. Actually, I talked with her a lot uh, when I was in Romania. She created a great group of Roma artists, and yeah. I have Roma roots on my father's side. We, we never really talked enough about that in my family. So that's why I don't talk enough about that, because I feel yeah. that, you know, I wasn't raised in a Roma community. But, but Michaela, she's the real thing. I love her as an actor, as a writer, yeah. and her yeah. company, Jubilee Plan, yeah, is wonderful. She performed at, at the Seagull Center. What beautiful work, her interviews. So yeah, so I thank you. Thank you, thank you. And we're coming to the end of this week. And we coming up next week, also a big lineup. Milo Rao is going to come back and talk about his book, Why Theater, he, he did with Katja de Garten and uh, Carmen and others. Um, so he was, really wanted to come back and also tell us about this a significant, I think, also collection of, uh, of ideas of the time we are in um, uh, uh, now. Florian Malzacker, the German uh, curator, will talk about his ideas of games for society, that the theater perhaps of, of, of games or instructions and engaging audience of what we uh, will do. And then we have Handan Osbilgen, who puts together an online festival, especially for uh, communities, immigrant communities, uh, communities of people of color. And, um, and she has done that for a very long time. And uh, it's also coming up. So she will talk also about her experience as a Turkish woman, you know, to, to work in the arts and, uh, and her divided loyalties in a way and her experiences. So uh, Sariana, really thank you, thank you. I hope it was as inspiring for you as it was for us. Uh, good luck uh, with your work and uh, the um, admire the discipline you have uh, that you keep on writing and working and yeah uh, I can only imagine uh, how hard it is especially also for someone like you to be in the time of corona to be in your place and that the world all of a sudden is reduced to screen like now when you click on leave it's over right and we are just again with us there's no drink after no coffee no noises of buddies in rooms and hellos and outside so it's very hard uh, time for everybody in the arts and um but nothing lasts forever not the good not, but also not the bad and uh, there will be different but we have to be ready we have to prepare now and we have to implement the real change so thank you thank you all for listening uh, this is all what saviana that is for you actually she might look like she wants to talk to me but actually she really does it because of the listeners we have here and what you think and that it hopefully, uh, you know, creates something real that thoughts travel and have an impact. So please do consider very carefully all what she said and what, what she's thinking about and what she's working on. And, uh, and thanks to HowlRound again for hosting us, the VJ and Andy from the Cedar Center to make this happen. So I'm going to have a good weekend and uh, hope you all will uh, join us next week. Stay safe, stay tuned and uh, all my best. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Frank. It was a pleasure to talk with you and hopefully, yes, with the audiences all around.